and welcome back to part three of Betting People with Maddie Playl. Now, um, we've talked not only about uh, the racing post in the past, but also your background in racing, but um, looking down the future, um, when racing returns, um, what changes would you make if you were in charge of sports, um, if any? <laughs> What, what a question that is, and it, it seems crazy that, um, you know, people would be would be asking me that. Um, I certainly think if we're talking about challenges, I mean, we're in the midst of one right now, aren't we? As mm. I mentioned um, earlier, I mean, COVID-19 is going to be huge um, and devastating impacts for every industry as well as racing, but I don't think I've ever known or heard of anything that would have impacted racing in this way before. So that's obviously one, but we're, we're not going to know the extent of that or the, the details on that, um, you know, until, until racing returns and, and what happens with all the classics and the big races and how long is it going to be before uh, we'll have people back on race courses again? We, we just don't really know at the moment. In terms of things that I would change or challenges, I think it's become a really dirty word and I'm not quite sure why, but perception is one. And I think that's to do with whether you're talking about integrity or welfare. Um, you know, it, it, it's not something that, I think we should be obsessing about and um, you know really getting worried about or we need to do make any great changes or anything like that but I think you know realistically in this society even in the last few years you look at social habits and you look at the way that you know uh, the population have changed in in the actions they take and um, I think perception is is something that we've got to navigate carefully you know we have to respect the traditions of racing and um, you know believe in racing and and um, yes champion it because it is an incredible sport and we should be very proud of what we have but at the same time we have to respect the way that the world has changed and um, adapt like any other sport um other things i think that are going to be a challenge are the issues with media rights at the moment it's a big stumbling block for racing um you know we have the incidents whereby owners uh, weren't allowed to video their horses due to the um conflict there with the, the those television rights and indeed with terrestrial television coverage with um, ITV still yet to sign a, sign a deal. Um, I mean, that, that it really is a huge issue for racing. And I think as social media gets bigger, you know, when we're talking about the, the first issue, it, it, the lines are still blurred as to what we can and can't do, uh, what, what, you know, people can and can't do. And, um, you know, if, if, if racing was to lose that terrestrial ITV coverage, that would be absolutely huge. So well, I think we have to try and um, preserve that and, and keep that because I think it's been a massive, massive success story, ITV and ITV's coverage in the last couple of years. And even the viewing figures would, would tell you that. But that approach, you know, whether you, you like it or not, it, it mm. has been very, very good for racing. I agree on... ITV, um, who are filling the mandate, by the way, of reaching people who wouldn't turn to, wouldn't think of turning to racing TV or Sky Sports Racing. And I should add, um, I think Sky Sports Racing have done an excellent job of using the Sky platform to promote the product, definitely down the line. And that does all go well, uh, especially if racing is one of the earlier sports to return, um, which might give it an increased viewership. Um, I think if, if we just talk about um, ITV, I think what yeah. they've done effectively is they're, or at least they're attempting to, and, you know, I've spoken with a lot of people at ITV, and I think that they're, they're doing so well and they're so forward thinking and they're constantly wanting to to better the, 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 the product is, is that they're struggling that line between, you know, someone who just wants to tune into some sport on a Saturday and the the hardcore racing fan, which is not an easy thing to do. And when you have people like Chris Hughes, who I think is absolutely fantastic for the game, 
who will get you know will raise the profile of racing to a newer audience with with the people that that he's attracting um i think that can only be a good thing i agree actually i think it is important that racing does work with um people from not only all other sports but also people who are public figures and i think one of the reasons chris hughes works so well is because he sort of taps so well into quite a big cultural demographic so exactly. I definitely agree there um looking forward to on track issues uh now i know we've just had a jump season cut short but we all know you're a huge jump aficionado are there any horses that our viewers should be looking out for when things return next season yeah um it's hard isn't it now it's it's I mean there's been a lot said about the Cheltenham Festival and and, and whether that should have gone ahead etc etc but um, it all seems like such a long time ago yet not very long ago at all it's strange isn't it um a couple I'll reel off a couple I must admit it took me a while to sort of sit through <laughs> and try and find some darker ones um one horse you probably won't be as dark to a lot of people um Captain Guinness I was a big fan of his um before he ran in the Supreme, obviously brought down. Um, and I think you look at Henry de Bromhead and his chasers, obviously won the arc with put the kettle on this year. And I think Captain Guinness could be a really, really smart horse next year. Obviously, we don't know how he would have fared in that Supreme, but he was in the process of running a great race. I don't think you should forget about him. Um, and another horse from the Supreme that I like, who might have just gone under the radar a little bit, and he did finish, and he ran a very good race, and that's All Art. Um, Nicky Henderson obviously had any number of promising novice hurdlers last season, but this one, I think, because he went round some of the smaller tracks, think Ludlow and Doncaster, winning small field novice hurdles, some people might have missed him a little bit. Um, but he ran a cracking race at Cheltenham, um, and I think he's very much one that will do better um, as he gets older and as he has time to mature. He was a very green horse early on last season. He's already proved that he's improved a lot from that. Uh, another novice hurdler. Again, I'm someone who tends to think long term. I'll, I'll see a novice hurdler and I'll think that'll be a, a, a really nice staying chaser in a couple of years. And one of those um, is Kapaj, uh, David Pipe uh, trains him. Uh, I think we last saw him winning a novice hurdle at Doncaster again, and um, soft ground is his forte. He's a really strong stayer, really likable horse. Again, was very green in the early stages of, of his career. And I can see him being a sort of Welsh Grand National horse a couple of years down the line. So he's one to keep an eye on. Wonderful. We'll definitely put all those in the notebook. And as a curveball, um, let's hope we get some flat racing soon. Any horses you're looking forward to um, this coming summer on level? It's tough, isn't it? I feel so uh, removed from all that at the moment with everything that's going on at the minute. Racing sort of pales into, into insignificance when we're talking about the bigger picture, but the same as everyone else, really. Um, I, I tell you what, I was quite interested to see what True Shan could achieve, um, Alan King's horse. He made a brilliant impression in a couple of races last year. I think that form with the likes of First in Line and um, Hamish, was it? I think that was really strong form. So, um, yeah, if we ever get to see him out again, I think he was touted as a, as a possible triumph contender at one point last year, uh, last season, last jump season. But, um, yeah, he's certainly very capable, so I'll be looking out for him. Wonderful. And speaking of horses, we all know there's a horse who's very, very special to you, very close to your heart. So please do tell us about your love affair with the mighty Tisselcrack. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite straightforward, really. I think, um, you know, everyone has the different horses that they latch on to when they first get into racing. And there were a couple um, for me, um, but Thistlecrack was probably the first horse that I had a proper, proper love for. And mostly it was just because of the the, the timing and, and how it worked out, to be honest. Um, I mean, when he first came onto the scene, that was when I, I think I learned to drive. So I was suddenly going racing a lot more and I've met a lot more people in racing. 
and I was beginning to really sort of feel like um, a part of a community and um, I, I don't know what it was to be honest with you I think he was the sort of star horse at that time and I was just in awe of his sort of power and the way he would beat horses over hurdles and he just made it look so easy he seemed to have a lot of charisma when he did it um, and I, I just loved the story to be honest that you know Colin Tizard he wasn't he had cue card but before that we all know that his sort of origins are quite romantic and um, everyone knows now that I love a Colin Tizard horse I just love the, the sort of horses that he tends to buy and be associated with but Thistlecrack was just an outstanding racehorse and he kept winning and he kept doing it in devastating fashion at a time when I was just starting to break into the sport and just starting to fall in love with it, I suppose. And he just, um, you know, even now, if I replay one of his wins, it just makes me feel like um, the luckiest person alive to work in racing, to be honest with you. I, I still do consider myself very, very lucky that I've managed to get these opportunities. And, you know, I'm, I'm 22 and hopefully there'll be um, a couple more. Um. Fantastic. Thank you for telling us about your love for the mighty machine that is Thistlecrack. Um, last question to end on. If you could have dinner with anybody in racing, who would it be? Okay, um, tough one. Lots, lots of people to choose from. Um, do you know what? I, I, and again, this is by way of, of, of plug as well, but that's not totally intentional. But what I would say is um, we had an interview on racingpost.com the other day. Um, Lee Moss had did it a couple of years ago with Gay Waterhouse and um, just a brilliant interview. And I just read it and thought, wouldn't she be incredible to just have a sit down with and, and have a chat to Gay Waterhouse? I do know I'm a great international racing fan try and keep tabs on racing all over the place. So uh, yeah, I think Gay Waterhouse would have to be top of the list. I think she'd be um, brilliant to just have a conversation with. Fantastic, that's a great answer and a great way to end what has been a great Spectrum People interview. Manny Clare, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Will.